All right, uh, let's finish up talking about the laramide orogeny, shall we? <clears throat> Again, it we talked about this in the past because the laramide orogeny actually began in the Cretaceous, but finished in the Cenozoic. Let's go ahead and talk about it. So it did differ from previous orogenies um, in a couple of important ways. First, it occurred much farther inland. It wasn't right on the west coast. In fact, it kind of bypassed the areas of the Nevada and, and Sevier orogenies and occurred further inland. Um, and neither volcanism nor emplacement of large plutons, like what we see more coastally, occurred. So that was that was number one. Number two, the form of deformation mostly took the form of kind of vertical faults where things were, or big blocks of earth were broken and moved up or moved down rather than, than just compressional folding that we see uh, and thrust faultings that we see typically at convergent boundaries. If you think back to how the Appalachians formed, excuse me, um, when Pangaea was forming at that convergent boundary over on the other side of North America, uh, all of those layers were kind of folded and thrusted up. Um, but again, that's not what we see here in the Laramide orogeny, which is famous for the Rocky Mountains. And that is due, and we did touch on this in Unit 11, to the change of angle of the subducting Farallon plate. <clears throat> so at a normal steep angle, the oceanic crust was being subducted um, and then, um, you know, creating these coastal ranges. But then all of a sudden, as North America continued to the west and the Farallon plate was heading towards the east, as the continental crust of the North American plate overrode the Farallon plate and the plume that was kind of maybe holding it up, it changed from a steep angle to more of a, a shallow angle. And so that put more pressure not on the coast, but more on the interior past what was already there, the Nevada and the Sevier orogeny. So then we get that laramide faulting and definition for uh, or deformation, excuse me, further, further inland. Um, and that's really what uh, helped to create, the, again, the Rocky Mountains. Some of the tallest Rocky Mountains are in Colorado, uh, to probably no one's surprise. Pikes Peak, which I uh, mentioned um, last section when we are talking about the Himalayas. Uh, the actual um, tallest peak in the Rockies is uh, Mount Elbert in Colorado. Now, it's not the tallest peak in the contiguous U.S., that's the lower 48 states, that's actually um, uh, down in California. But the actual tallest peak in North America, in the continent, is actually up in Alaska, uh, Mount Denali, much bigger. But we're just talking about the Rockies here. Um, and so any peak that's over 14,000 feet, they call a 14er. Uh, that's pretty big. It's a pretty big mountain. You know, if you can climb up that, and there's, you know, it's hard on the lungs. Uh, it's obviously only half the height of Mount Everest, which is 29 plus thousand feet in elevation. But in any case, if you ever get a chance to to hike the Rockies, please do. So anyway, just kind of finished the Laramide orogeny. Now during the Cenozoic, the Rockies are finally kind of coming into fruition, and kind of in conjunction with what's what had been going on in the same area. When we come back, we'll talk about the Colorado Plateau. I'll see you back here in just a second.